mate 40 here so the news about the u.s supreme court striking down affirmative action on the basis of race into universities it did seem like a lot of journalists took that very personally because journalism as a whole is not a business that can stand on its own two feet it's heavily subsidized and therefore it needs to accommodate itself to the powers that be and the powers that be the ones who rule virtually all institutions in our country are on the left and the left is very pro affirmative action right remember woke means that there are certain groups certain allegedly oppressed minority groups such as blacks and lgbtq trans etc who must be exempt from criticism here's uh, how it Half goes a century ago the media and the liberals loved the supreme court and why not those justices established the constitutional right to abortion in roe v wade and said race could be considered as a factor in college admissions in the baki case conservatives ripped those rulings but didn't try to discredit the court but with today's john roberts court overturning both those rulings in the past year the national right to abortion and last week tossing out college affirmative action there's been some Something of a media freakout. Add to that the court knocking down Joe Biden's student debt relief and saying a web designer can't be forced to design a same-sex wedding site, and you have many infuriated Democrats. AOC says impeachment is not off the table. Congressman Ted Lieu says he wants to expand the high court because of its radical extreme supermajority. Uh, keep in mind that court packing turned into a fiasco for FDR. Freedom of action has always had a contradiction at its heart hurting some people like Asian Americans who are also a minority while helping others such as blacks and Hispanics and has brought out plenty of ugliness. The Atlantic's Jamel Hill, who is black, telling an Asian American on Twitter that you gladly carried the water for white supremacy and stabbed the folks in the back whose people fought diligently for Asian American rights, white supremacy. It's perfectly fine for pundits to attack SCOTUS rulings they don't like, but is it going too far, based on partisan differences, to try to undermine the institution? I'm Howard Kurtz, and this is Media Buzz. These end-of-the-term rulings are fueling heated media reactions on the left and the right, sometimes in quite personal terms, as well as from the president. Is this a rogue court? This is not a normal court. Impeach the justices, term limit the justices, pack the court. For all the talk of civility and the talk of the restoration of norms, it seems there is no institution of our republic that won't be destroyed in defense of their democracy. This court has adopted a kind of imperial mindset. Six right-wing politicians in robes on the Trump Supreme Court are granting themselves the authority to govern as a kind of unaccountable super legislature. The court's affirmative action ruling, uh, which was pivotal, um, it's causing liberals' heads to explode. They are even using it to call Asians white supremacists. And I'm not joking, I'm not making this up. It's the feeling that I and people who look like me and were born like me don't have the right to the promise of America as spelled out in our founding documents. Wow, so unless, unless people like Jonathan Capehart, who's a twofer, right, both black and gay, he feels denied the promise of America unless the playing field is tilted in his favor. So right now, Harvard uses approximately a 400 SAT you know, point advantage to, to admit black students. If they were admitted solely on the basis of, of merit, according to one study, fewer than 1% of Harvard would be black. But uh, Harvard's Reshman class, by contrast, is 15% black. That's, so by those standards, according to that study, that means that uh, only about 6 out of 100 blacks in Harvard's freshman class would, would be there if the sole basis for admission was academic merit. Joining us now to analyze the coverage, Ben Dominich, editor-at-large for The Spectator, and Richard Fallow, the radio talk show host, both are Fox News contributors. Ben, how did we go from the media criticizing these last Supreme Court decisions to denouncing its credibility and calling it corrupt? 
Well, one of the big things that's left out of all of this is that this court has actually been quite balanced in its rulings. It dealt uh, some real losses uh, mm -hmm. to Republican efforts when it came to redistricting and the like just earlier in this term. Uh, and policy. obviously, you know, there's there's a number of other areas where, you know, it performed in ways that are, you know, completely at odds with the framing of them, you know, as Chris Hayes said there, of being this kind of imperial, you know, uh, entity handing down uh, rulings. The other thing that I think that is left out here is that of all the entities that uh, represent our federal government at the, more, uh, at the moment, I would argue that the court is being the most representative of public opinion in the sense that if you actually look at the uh, affirmative action question when asked both by Harvard's own polling efforts and by uh, the Pew uh, Forum and the like over the last several years, it's a 70-30 issue at best. It's se uh, the most recent uh, Pew poll was 74-26 in terms of, Harvard's of the own number of Americans who are opposed to affirmative action. And so I don't think that this has has the same kind of flavor uh, as it would in perhaps other areas where it's viewed as the court supplanting itself over public opinion. In fact, they are ruling according to the Constitution and, it's in, and it is consistent with where Americans are. Well, you have a point on affirmative action, but Richard, with the AOC talking about impeachment and Dems talking about court packing, the media reporting on this is not that this is Looney Tunes, and we all know that none of this is going to happen. Look, listen, I, I think there's, the media is missing a story here, right, and I think it's important to figure out the missing stories so you can understand where AOC and all these folks uh -huh. come, will come up with court packing, I think. And that has to do with many of the ethical missteps that the court has made over recent, right? We have pictures of Supreme Court justices palling it up with millionaires and... Oh, my God, the Supreme Court justices are palling it up with, with millionaires. We, we, we can't have that. I mean... The court must be corrupt then. Way to say, hey, we're going to unelect them or they're beholden to the people. So with that being said, when you put the affirmative action court, when you put the affirmative action ruling in the microscope and you say, well, OK, so if this is hurdle to most applicants. So. But before that, the coverage was like, this is the apocalypse. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I certainly think that, you know, there's an overreaction on, on this point because uh, of so much of the dedication of a lot, a significant portion of the left to the ideas that are, that undergird the affirmative action system. But I would point to the analysis of someone who I think is, is one of the most intelligent uh, political analysts on the left, uh, Rui Teixeira, who's formerly of the Center for American Progress, now at AEI, who made the point that if you're actually running against this, you're doing it at odds with the current trends among the American working class and middle class in mm -hmm. terms of their priorities. Priorities. You're doing it, you know, completely at odds with what we see them saying about that way that they want our college systems to work. And I didn't hear any of that in this media coverage. Any of it sort of saying, well, you know, the court is basically saying we have to reset on this, on these things, on these different questions. The colleges are free to analyze things in different ways, which I expect that they, they will. You know, uh, leaning more into personal essays, leaning more into things like that, as opposed to, to test scores. There's going to be a backlash to this. But yeah, it's fascinating how conservatives are so quick to claim that absolutely hopeless that uh, these Kenny left-wing college administrators will figure out ways to get around this. Well, California banned affirmative action, and as a result, there's been a dramatic decrease in the number of you know light, low IQ groups admitted to our elite universities. So the university industrial complex will found ways of mitigating, mediating, reducing the claims of merit, all right, to maintain a certain diversity of uh, low, low achieving groups, but this will still have a substantial uh, effect. Okay, so I was able to sleep in this morning, so I'm so energized right now, I was able to sleep in until about 4.20 this morning. After my shower, I fired up my computer, and just before I was going into my, my recorded 12-step talks that I like to listen to to get my head straight for the day, this is what YouTube promoted to me on, on the front page of YouTube.com. So surely, guys, surely YouTube is not promoting misinformation here. Well, warm welcome to today's talk, Tuesday, the 6th of June. Now, today I want to report on the most impressive piece of scholarship that's so far been released on the... Most impressive piece of scholarship? Oh, it's from a, a, a doctor, Dr. John Campbell. A doctor? Well, not a medical doctor. He's a retired dude in public health who used to teach nursing. But it's really important to him that you think of him as a doctor. They're not a medical doctor. So in, in Australia, right, chiropractors are not considered doctors. But whenever I talk to a chiropractor on the phone or in real life, they always introduce themselves. This is, you know, Dr. Cohen, you know, Dr. Ali, <laughs> Dr. Salazar. 
And whenever I talk to a medical doctor, it's invariably, you know, this is John, this is Pete. The effect of lockdowns. This is it here. The whole thing is available and in the public domain. And I'm just going to give you a headline to see if you uh, want to watch this video or not. Uh, the, the talk is called Lockdowns Were a Costly Failure. And COVID-19 lockdowns were a global policy failure of gigantic proportions, according to this report. And this report actually looks at empirical data, real numbers in the real world, not... Whoa, this report, guys, it looks at empirical data. I mean, it's looking at real numbers in the real world. This bloke's got 2.81 million subscribers. And he's saying that evidence on COVID restrictions is now conclusive that they were absolutely useless because we have a John Hopkins study, guys. A John Hopkins study looking at real data, empirical data, data from, you guessed it, hold on, the real world. Whoa. Not modeling as was done pretty well always in the past. Oh, so it's just modeling being done in the past. So uh, socially isolating yourself is a response to pandemics that's existed for thousands of years. It was existed in biblical times, right? The Torah prescribes social isolation during, you know, sometimes a plague and pandemic. It's, it was used with regard to the Black Death. It's a very common time-tested way of responding to social pandemics. But apparently all studies until now, according to this doctor, were just based on modeling. But now we've got empirical real-world data. Very exciting. So that's what this is about. Now, this is the report here, uh, just released on the, just released in June. Uh, as I say, very thorough report, all available in the public domain, published by the London-based Institute of uh, Economic, uh, Economic Affairs. And Okay, so this is a libertarian institute. Uh, it goes on to well over 200 pages. So um, check it out for yourself, completely free to download, which is very magnanimous, of course, of the authors in the Institute of Economic Affairs to do that, um, but, but comprehensive and completely readable. So let's get straight down to what it's talking about now. Lockdowns were a costly failure, giant, a global policy failure. So th this is everywhere. Um, pretty well, wherever you are, um, we've been let down by our government. So we'll be looking at the way reports were written, but not adequately scrutinized by government. This is primarily a governmental failure. So this guy is upset that uh, we haven't adequately scrutinized previous academic studies. So you can be sure that he's thoroughly scrutinized this particular study. Guys, we, we need to thoroughly scrutinize these things before we change our way of life. And I personally feel let down, and, and, and I know a lot of you do uh, as well. Um, now, this is the update we're just looking at here. That was the previous version there. So as I say, all available, check it out for yourself. So systematic review and meta-analysis. So it takes to combat. So when I have friends who want to push like fringe uh, medical scientific theories on me, I always tell them, send me, and they, what they usually send me are like uh, tweets from you know various randos. And I say, no, send me a meta-analysis published in a prestigious journal, all right? You, if you meta-analysis mean you look at all the previous studies on the topic and you rate and rank the, the studies by their power, right? By, you know, how, how important they are, by, you know, how many people they use, the, the methods that we use. And so you, you develop an overview of all learning in a particular area until now and you put it all together, all right? So meta-analysis, absolutely essential for getting a handle on things. but what uh, this review does not do is uh, publish in a prestigious journal. Now, that doesn't mean it's wrong, but uh, if I'm going to spend my time reading a scientific study, I want it to be in a prestigious journal. And uh, if it's going to be something groundbreaking, normally I'm going to want to see a meta-analysis. The nation of useful papers, which is an excellent way to do research. Uh, published in London, um, Institute of Economic Affairs. Did lock down COVID restrictions, social distancing, non-pharmaceutical interventions, whatever you want to call it. Uh, affect COVID uh, mortality based on the empirical evidence. This is not someone sitting in a back room with a sophisticated uh, calculator or a sophisticated computer. This is actually real world data. What wow. actually happened? And of course, that wow. is what science is all about. Science is wow. all about empiricism or it's about nothing at all. Science is not theoretical. It is a practical discipline. Um, systematic search and screening procedure. So they looked at pretty well 20,000 studies, 32 qualified, but only 22 converted for meta-analysis. And that is because only 22 contain the real world data that was required. In other words, the numbers, the numbers in the real world. And this is why this study is so refreshing. We're getting back to reality. I think we've been in a bit of a, bit of a flight of fancy for the past few years. Uh, Thank God, guys, we're getting back to reality. All right, finally, we've got some scrutiny and we're going to deal here with empiricism and real world data. I mean, what a relief. Thank God that there are these brave contrarian voices out there. Even though squelched by YouTube and, I mean, poor bloke's been limited to just 2.81 million subscribers, Dr. Dr. John Campbell.
right? Not a not a medical doctor, but a retired nursing instructor. Uh, ably led by government and mainstream media. Uh, but now we're back to scientific reality, which delights me. Wow. Um, so 22 studies actually measured mortality data not derived from modeling. Now, they used a stringency index as one of the uh, one of the things they looked at. And that's how strict the lockdowns were. So they were comparing to less strict areas such as Sweden. Average lockdown in Europe and the United States in the spring of 2020, which is as far as this data goes. So this is the essentially the first wave, isn't it? The spring of 2020 only reduced mortality uh, COVID-19 by 3.2 percent. Man, this is so exciting. I mean, I, I'm so, so thrilled to be able to share this with you. And luckily, Fox News is on this story, guys. CNN, MSNBC, New York Times, Washington Post completely avoid John Hopkins study finding COVID lockdowns ineffective. Man, why do they, why do they try to hide the truth from us? I mean, next they're going to start turning the, the frogs gay. Come on, guys. I, we are getting reaction down. tonight to wow. a report we told you about yesterday, concluding the coronavirus lockdowns have had little to no effect on mortality during the pandemic. Correspondent Jonathan Seary shows us tonight from Atlanta. Opponents of mandates are expressing vindication after one of the most trusted sources of data on COVID-19, Johns Hopkins University, published a study concluding that lockdown policies are ill-founded and should be rejected as a pandemic policy instrument. I think it's very appropriate that we take a look back and admit our mistakes. Uh, if, if, if we were wrong, we need to know for the next pandemic. In the Johns Hopkins report, three leading economists analyzed data from 24 studies and determined travel bans and mandatory school and business closures early in the pandemic reduced COVID deaths by only 0.2 percent. I think it's important that we try and remove all the politics and really talk about what the data shows, what science shows, and, and support free inquiry and, and people asking important questions about how to get pandemic policy correct because this isn't the last pandemic we're going to face. The study was not mentioned in today's White House COVID briefing. However, federal health officials said they welcome a proposal in the Senate to create a bipartisan task force to investigate the pandemic's origins and the response of the Trump and Biden administrations. I think it's important to look at every aspect of this outbreak for lessons learned. That is not only what the origin of the virus and the origin of the outbreak is, but many other things that we could learn from in the future so that we can prevent something like this happening or respond better if and when it does. And an FDA advisory panel is scheduled to meet February 15 to discuss Pfizer's application to expand vaccine access to children under the age of five. A Kaiser Family Foundation survey finds that three in 10 parents with kids in this age group would get the shots for their children right away if approved. John? All right, we'll see where that approval goes. Jonathan Sari for. Well, wow, thank God for Fox News, those brave truth soldiers at Fox News. Like they're, they're willing to, they're willing to, you know, bring us the news that the, the mainstream media is just, you know, just trying to black out from from our knowledge. All right, uh, this is Bruce Lee. He's a senior contributor to Ford's. He's a writer and a journalist and a systems modeler. What does he have to say? Did so-called Johns Hopkins study? Really show lockdowns were ineffective against COVID-19? By Bruce Y. Lee. Have you seen the so-called Johns Hopkins study that's been making the social media and Bill Maher rounds lately? Some folks have been asserting that this Johns Hopkins study somehow showed that COVID-19 lockdowns have been essentially useless. If you haven't seen what they've been referring to, could it possibly be because there's been so-called a full-on media blackout of this so-called Johns Hopkins study? as an article for Fox News has claimed? Or maybe, just maybe, this Johns Hopkins study didn't receive much press because it wasn't exactly what some people have been claiming that it is. If you've noticed, some have been repeating the name Johns Hopkins study as if it were some kind of magical phrase like open sesame or umbop. In actuality, it's not really appropriate here to call what's being circulated a Johns Hopkins study which might suggest that Johns Hopkins University has somehow commissioned or endorsed the study. Nevertheless, some people in social media accounts have been pushing the whole Johns Hopkins name. Yeah, the university itself didn't write the paper, because buildings can't type on laptops without crushing them. Heck, the paper even stated that, 
Views expressed in each working paper are those of the authors and not necessarily those of the institutions that the authors are affiliated with. Therefore, if folks really want to mention Johns Hopkins, they should instead be referring to this working paper as being, from a professor at Johns Hopkins University, as Marr did in this past week's episode of his HBO show Real Time with Bill Marr. As you can see, Marr dropped the Johns Hopkins name without even mentioning the professor's name, Steve H. Hank, Ph.D., a professor of applied economics at Johns Hopkins University and a senior fellow at the Cato Institute, an American libertarian think tank. Marr also didn't specify that two of three authors weren't even from Johns Hopkins University, Jonas Irby, M.S., whom the working paper described as a special advisor at Center for Political Studies in Copenhagen, Denmark, and Lars Jonning, Ph.D., who is a professor emeritus in economics at Lund University, Sweden. Moreover, Marr didn't clarify that the three authors were economists rather than medical, epidemiology, or public health experts. Isn't that a bit like three proctologists telling you how the economy is doing? It's not clear how much economists alone would understand the complexities and subtleties of medicine and public health. After all, if you were to end up in the emergency room with an injury, don't worry an economist will be around shortly to reattach your arm, may not be the most comforting thing to hear. Oh, and note that Irby, Johnning, and Hank themselves used the term, working paper, to describe what they had put together. Simply calling it a, Johns Hopkins study, glosses over this important distinction. A working paper is not the same as a peer-reviewed study published in a reputable scientific journal just like how a YouTube video of you getting pelted with sausages would not be the same as a full-length Hollywood movie. Basically, anyone who has access to the internet, a laptop, smartphone, and opposable thumbs, can post a working paper on a website. So while it is clear that Meerkats alone did not write and post this working paper, take anything that it said with 17 Ugg boots full of salt. This working paper did make some bold claims. For example, it concluded that lockdowns have had little to no public health effects, they have imposed enormous economic and social costs where they have been adopted. In consequence, lockdown policies are ill-founded and should be rejected as a pandemic policy instrument. By the way, what did the authors consider lockdowns? Well, according to the working paper, lockdowns are defined as the imposition of at least one compulsory, non-pharmaceutical intervention, NPI. Wholly Changing Definitions, Batman. By Irby, Johnning, and Hank's definition, even face mask requirements would be considered a lockdown, right? After all, face masks are NPI since you don't eat or inject face masks into you. Yet, how many times have you heard when wearing a mask, how's that lockdown of your face going? Sure, a face mask may prevent your nose from wandering away from your face and partaking in a rave, before returning to your face in the morning. But other than that, face mask requirements really don't restrict your ability to move away from your home. This doesn't quite jibe with the dictionary.com definition which describes a lockdown as a security measure taken during an emergency to prevent people from leaving or entering a building or other location. So unless you are wearing a ridiculously enormous face mask or one with BDSM chains attached to your friend, wearing a face mask shouldn't prevent you from leaving or entering most buildings. Okay, changing definitions aside, did this working paper really provide enough evidence to support its bold claims? In a word, no. In two words, heck no. The authors claim that they performed a systematic review and meta-analysis. That should mean that they should have considered and included all published peer-reviewed studies relevant to the topic at hand. Yet, this working paper did not include or even acknowledge many such studies that have shown the benefits of NPI such as face mask wearing and social distancing without explaining why the three authors excluded such studies. Of the 34 studies included in the review, 12 of them were actually working papers. In fact, 14 of the studies were actually from economists with only one being from epidemiologists. This is odd since most of the key NPI research studies have been conducted by epidemiologists, medical researchers, and other public health experts. To qualify as a meta-analysis, a study needs to fulfill established criteria, which includes demonstrating that you've included all of the studies that have been published. Without providing clear evidence that you have done so, instead of a literature review and meta-analysis of the effects of lockdowns on COVID-19 mortality, would a better title of this working paper have been, Stuff That We Selected to Support Our Point of View? Not only that, 
others have pointed out various flaws in the working paper's actual analyses. For example, here's what Gideon Meyerowitz Katz, an epidemiologist, tweeted. Later in the tweet thread, Meyerowitz Katz suggested that some cherry picking was going on with the working paper. And when you do a review of the literature and select a paper to be included in your so called meta analysis, it's not a good sign when the authors of that paper disagree with your interpretation of their paper. Claiming that NPIs have had little to no public health effects simply goes against what's been observed and documented throughout this COVID 19 pandemic. Just look at the rather stark differences among how countries have fared during this pandemic in terms of COVID 19 cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. Countries that have followed the existing scientific evidence, such as New Zealand, Taiwan, and South Korea, have had much fewer deaths and hospitalizations than countries that have frequently veered away from the science, such as the US, the UK, and Brazil. These certainly weren't the only problematic issues with the working paper. But why go deeper into them since there's been a so called media blackout of this paper, right? At least, that's what Joseph A. Wolfson, a media reporter for Fox News, tweeted in all caps. Yep, Wolfson claimed in an article for Fox News that there has been a full-on media blackout of the new study outlining the ineffectiveness of lockdowns to prevent COVID deaths. Really? A full-on media blackout? Apparently, many of us didn't get the memo. In his article, he asserted that the Johns Hopkins study received no mention on any of the five liberal networks this week. According to Grabian transcripts, CNN, MSNBC, ABC, CBS and NBC all ignored the anti-lockdown findings after having spent much of the pandemic shaming red states with minimal restrictions and events deemed by critics as super-spreaders. Uh, there were plenty of non-political and non-partisan reasons not to cover this working paper. Obviously, media outlets can't cover everything that anyone happens to post on a website. Otherwise, you'd be getting daily updates on what's been posted on the Fart Share website. It's not clear what a full-on media blackout even means or how exactly it would work. How in the world would someone corral all legitimate journalists everywhere and tell them not to cover something? Would there be a secret sign, emoji, or set of semaphores? And would space lasers somehow be involved? Telling real journalists not to write about something probably would motivate them even more to write about it. This whole, Johns Hopkins study, situation is like deja vu all over again. Back in April 2021, I covered for Forbes how some people were pushing a so-called Stanford study that wasn't exactly from Stanford and wasn't even really a study. So be wary whenever people emphasize the name of any particular academic institution associated with a study rather than focusing on the study itself and who specifically performed it. Universities consist of many different professors and other academics who have varying levels of expertise and experience in the academic freedom to pursue whatever research they choose. Just because someone is from a given university doesn't necessarily mean that the person knows what he or she is talking about. Again, instead, evaluate the person's background and what specifically he or she is saying. Sure, Irby, Johnning, and Hank working paper may not sound quite the same as a Johns Hopkins study. But in this case, the former would be a whole lot more accurate description than the latter. Okay, there's a lot of common sense there in that. Uh... In that analysis, I mean, that uh, people on the right in particular are just the dissidently inclined or just jumping all over this. This study seemed uh, sympathetic, right? I mean, touting itself as a Johns Hopkins study because <laughs> it was conducted by an economist at John Hopkins, uh, then claiming there was a full-on media blackout of the paper, right? The, first of all, paper is a working paper, not peer-reviewed. It was published on the website of the Institute for Applied Economics, right? not exactly a traditional medical institution. Right? None of the authors are doctors or scientists. They're, there are two economists and one employee of this libertarian institute. Uh, all of these trio are, have been extremely anti-lockdown since March 2020. And, uh, yeah, the paper has got a really weird definition of lockdown, right? So the most inconsistent aspect of the paper is reinterpreting what a lockdown is. The authors define lockdown as the imposition of at least one compulsory non-pharmaceutical intervention. So if you wear a face mask anywhere, that is considered a lockdown. 
So Neil Ferguson of Imperial College says, by this definition, the UK has been in permanent lockdown since the 16th of March 2021 and remains in lockdown, given that it remains compulsory for people in the UK with diagnosed COVID to self-isolate for at least five days. Of the 34 papers ultimately selected for this meta-analysis, 12 were working papers rather than peer-reviewed. 14 studies were conducted by economists, not exactly public health or medical experts, and the inclusion criteria doesn't include modeled counterfactuals, the most common method used in infectious disease assessments. It excludes most epidemiological research from the review. The included studies are not representative of research as a whole on lockdowns. Many of the most robust papers on the impact of lockdowns are excluded. All this adds up to is a very weird review paper. The authors exclude many of the most rigorous studies, but include those that are the entire basis for their meta-analysis in the first place. They then take a number of papers, most of which found that restrictive non-pharmaceutical interventions had a benefit on mortality and then derive some mathematical estimate from their regression coefficients indicating less benefit than the paper suggests. All this together means the actual numbers produced in the review are not interpretable. So if someone goes gaga over this paper and touts it as you know some major thing, like uh, Dr. John Campbell here, then uh, he's a pretty ignorant person. This translates to approximately 6,000 avoidable deaths in Europe, 4,000 avoidable deaths in the United States. And uh, when we come to look at the cost-benefit analysis, analysis of this and how this compares to other diseases, these really are small amounts given these people primarily with, with significant comorbidities. Not all, but primarily. Shall so Dr. John Campbell turns out to be primarily a t trainer of nurses, not exactly much of a doctor. So what's going on with uh, the Biden administration, the courts, and social media? So major court ruling. Judges ruled the Biden administration must limit most contacts with social media giants in a suit filed by Republican AGs in Louisiana and Missouri. In a decision some media folks are calling an attack on free speech, the Trump-appointed judge ruled that Biden officials went too far in lobbying to remove posts dealing with vaccines and interference in American elections. There are some allegations of some very heavy-handed tactics here where the government was pressuring social media companies to say what it wanted to say. When the government is telling social media companies what to do, there is a risk of censorship there. For them to now suddenly have a hands-off attitude and let anything uh, run rampant across all of these platforms would just be radical. Joining us now from Connecticut, Charlie Gasparino, senior reporter at Fox Business Network. Charlie, the judge in this case, and the Biden administration has appealed and the injunction could be overturned, says not only did the administration go too far in lobbying, pressuring uh, the social media companies to take things down, but has silenced conservatives in the process. Well, all that could be true, and this still could be kind of a funky ruling, right? I mean, listen, obviously the facts are not great here. The Biden administration basically was trying to—basically got Twitter, essentially, to censor anything that was not uh, not following the party line regarding vaccines and, and more than that. And, and, get, and actually getting people canceled. Alex Berenson, the journalist, was canceled because he's a vaccine skeptic. All horrible, disgusting stuff. But— I, I don't know. How is it illegal for the government to ask? <laughs> you you right. see what I'm saying? They don't make I mean, the final reporters. decision. The companies make right. the we're, final we're, decision. We're, right. We're reporters. We get a lot of crap from people, right? And people call our supervisors. Uh, the question, you know, you want kind of, you kind of want to have that dialogue with people that you're covering. And, yeah. you know, social media is kind of a journalism out, out, outfit, even though it does have, uh, uh, you know, pleasures that we don't have, like Section 230 of the Communications Act. They right. can't get Let's, sued for lying. By the way. But in any event, by it, the way, let, me, is, let me jump I don't, in. I don't, let me just jump in. Go, because go the Trump campaign did some of this as well. And the Twitter right. files investigation uncovered some of this. And the mainstream media basically ignored it. But do you see it as a battle over free speech? You know, it is a battle over free speech. I don't know about, I don't know the law here. The law seems dubious here that you can tell the government not to call up anybody, not to call up a social media company. Mm -hmm. Now, if the government was essentially, I don't know, bribing them, extorting them, okay, mm -hmm. you know, we'll take away X if you do if you don't if you don't ban Alex Berenson from Twitter. Well, then we're talking, then that's legal, and that's not a First Amendment issue. That's that's a crime, okay? Now, yeah. can you charge a government for that? I don't know, but Fair point. that gets into another area. So Mark Zuckerberg got 70 million signups in a couple of days for his new... 
Okay, so if the full force of the United States government is reaching out to you, is it, doesn't that inherently have a, a chilling effect, right? If the White House reaches out to you, right, you, you know so much of your welfare and your, your profits are based upon government uh, favor. Why would you not be intimidated? Why would that not have a censorious effect? Okay, so I'm struck by all the coverage of the French riots that almost all the coverage treats it as something that's unique to France and some problem with France when in reality the populations involved they cause very similar problems everywhere they are in the world there's nothing particularly French about these French race riots so let me let me play a little bit here from our favorite uh, Peter Zion. France. Uh, there have been a number of protests and a number of schools and police officers have been burned in the last couple of days. The triggering event is the police killed a kid. Um, I want to say he was like 15, 17, something like that. And so there's been this spontaneous uprising of violence. We haven't seen activity like this since 2005. Back then, similar cause, uh, police killed a couple of kids that were hiding from the police, and it triggered riots that lasted several weeks. Uh, too soon to know if this is going to be one of those sort of explosive, protracted events, but it's worth considering because France is not like a lot of other places. Now, here in the United States... Yeah, so he's saying essentially there's something unique to France that's uh, causing th these riots, but... I have a bigger question. Where exactly has it worked out well for a host first world country to import low IQ groups? So I can understand in certain circumstances where you desperately need the labor and being low IQ uh, isn't disqualifying because you have such a desperate need for labor. But where has it worked out very well for any first world country to import low IQ groups? I'm just unaware of that working out well for anyone everywhere that has done this has ended up with French, these, these type of uh, French race riots. We obviously have a checkered past uh, and a checkered present when it comes to issues of race, and it's part of the conversation all the time. Uh, checkered meaning that uh, different groups tend to have different gifts, tend to perform at different levels, have different levels of educational attainment, different levels of uh, income, different levels of law abidingness, you know, different levels of committing rape and murder time. And there are members of a number of minorities that are represented in governments at all levels, especially the national level. We've even had a uh, black president. Uh, that is not the situation in France. In France, uh, they made the decision back after the revolution that ethnic conflict was so extreme that they had to redefine what the term... Okay, so where on earth with these particular ethnic mixes have they gotten it right? Right? There are different approaches but none of them have borne any empirical result that uh, any sane country would want to model. Not the United States, not Canada, not Australia, not England, not, not France, not Germany. Term French mean. So it didn't matter if you were Catalan or Basque or from Paris or Marseille or Alsatian, it didn't matter. Everyone was French now. And all of the various groups that had been part of a series of civil wars and disturbances in France going back a millennium, all of a sudden were considered... How do you know if groups are low IQ? Well, it's about the most replicated part of social science. We're in the replication crisis of social science, but the most replicable, most predictive, and most explanatory analysis in social sciences is the predictive power of IQ for, for groups of you know, large numbers, right? You can, give, you can also give an individual kid a, a, an IQ test at age six, and you pretty much know what he's capable of achieving as an adult, all right? If he scores under 100 on a Raven's matrices test at age six, all right, he's never going to graduate college. He's going to need, you know, a lot of help as he goes forward. All of the same family. And in the modern age, what that means is it's illegal, uh, unconstitutional even, to collect ethnic data on the French population. And if everyone was just Basque or Catalan or French or Alsatian, that might be okay. But that is not the France of today. As part... Now, I know what you're thinking, Forty. Wouldn't it be wonderful if, like, nature color-coded people to our advantage so we could just look at it and see at a glance whether someone was, you know, likely to be dangerous, whether someone was likely to be intelligent, whether someone was likely to be a good fit? Ah, I mean, this, this urge for, for simple solutions. Now, of course, you can look and tell at a glance whether someone's usually male or female, and we know that men are 10, 20 times more likely to commit murder than women, that uh, young men are you know, far more likely to commit murder than older men, 
So I guess there are some things you can just tell at a glance, but uh, unfortunately, nature hasn't color-coded people for our benefit. Gosh darn it. Of the colonial legacy, a number of people from their former colonies have moved to the mainland France, metropolitan France, and even have French citizenship. In fact, in some cases, their great-great-grandparents had French citizenship. So these are not people who arrived recently. But because it's illegal, unconstitutional... Wow, so the people writing are not necessarily people who've arrived recently, but apparently knowing who someone's ancestors are is highly predictive of you know how individuals will perform and it's true like low performing groups tend to stay low performing over many generations so sometimes they even regress so in some ways like second and third first second and third mexican immigrants to california are higher achieving than fourth and fifth generation mexican immigrants Institutional to collect any sort of racial data, they exist as a sort of second class that is, from the American term, almost undocumented because of the racism that exists in all societies. So, in the case of. So, why do I assume that these riots are low IQ? Because higher IQ people are more able to see the future, and smarter people would recognize that participating in riots like these has a very good probability of destroying your future life prospects. And so, higher IQ people would be much less likely to engage in the type of rioting that is convulsing France right now. Also, we know the average IQ of a prison population is usually around 90. So crime is overwhelmingly something that is committed by low IQ people, except for, you know, high IQ forms of white collar crime. Friends, they don't even know how big the racial problem is. It's probably about 15% of the population is non-ethnic French but legally French. Uh, and that has institutionalized the racism in a way that we have a really hard time. Institutionalized the racism, right? There's, there's no such thing as racism. It's an entirely you know, made up moral category. People just prefer people like themselves, right? Everyone has an in-group preference and uh, often race is a component of people's in-group preference. Clint Medley knows that if the, the mean IQ is mean, then it's better unseen processing here in the United States. In many cases, it's more similar to what they've got in Brazil. You've got an urban center where the ethnic French live that is relatively well off, and then you've got a ring of suburbs that is more akin to... So were the January 6 rioters all low IQ? Uh, they were not rocket scientists. All right, It was an idiotic thing to do, and yeah, I think that they were a very modest IQ. I, I would be surprised if the average IQ of the January 6 rioters, particularly the ones fighting the police, you know, it was much above 100. So anyone with anything to lose would, would have been highly unlikely to participate in the January 6 riots. So if you had a prestigious position, such as you're a TV commentator, you were a professor, you were an important bureaucrat, you're a CEO of a company, right? you'd be highly unlikely to participate in things like the January 6 riots or the current uh, French race riots slums where most of the non-ethnic French who are still French citizens live. Would uh, Forty send the January 6 people to Gitmo if he were president? I, I would just, uh, I would allow the justice system to work. I, I am not up in arms that some of them, you know, have been sentenced to years in prison. Like, I think anyone who participated in the January 6 riots and didn't get shot and killed on the spot by police should simply count themselves lucky. And so that they are still alive, right? I think they should simply have gratitude for that. So I am all for cracking down and prosecuting rioters, whether they are on the right or the left, prosecuting them to the full extent of the law. I don't think it's necessary to send them to Gitmo, but to put them away for a long time in prison, let that serve as a warning to others, is a really stupid thing to, to do. But they did. It wasn't an insurrection. It wasn't a coup. It was a riot that got out of control, and uh, idiotic people need to be punished for that sort of destructive behavior. And because the French can't even do the first step of collecting data in order to get a good grip on what the size of the issue is, it's really hard for the government to apportion resources. Yeah, higher IQ January 6 rioters didn't riot. They stayed away. All right, they weren't heading into combat. So don't join low IQ groups like the Proud Boys or any low IQ groups. Uh... I remember I was walking around with this Orthodox Jew from Israel, and he just started yelling death to the Arabs. I mean, just totally a moronic thing to be yelling in, in Beverly Hills. Right? Beverly Hills is still majority Jewish, but it's just an idiotic thing to be yelling out loud 
And uh, it's not really a high IQ thing to do. This was not a, a doctor, a lawyer, a dentist, an accountant, or a professor, or a CEO. Sources outside of law enforcement. So in many ways, parts of France, even in their major cities, resemble a little bit of armed camps. And that makes it very easy for uh, violence to erupt because it's, it's not a big reach for people who are the subject of... You know what makes it really easy for violence to erupt? People who have low, low IQs, don't have much of a future time horizon, don't have a lot to lose, and who have you know, developed all sorts of assertive and aggressive tendencies that may well serve them in one particular environment, but uh, don't serve them as well in a first world country. ...living in the armed camps to rebel against the people who are supposedly providing law and order. Now, for those of you who know my work, you know that I'm very bullish on France in the long run. They never bet their economic, much less their political system, on globalization, and they never integrated their economy into the European Union. They've always seen themselves as a step apart, and that means that they've sacrificed a lot of efficiencies and a lot of the reach they could have gotten under the globalized era in order to maintain a more nationally oriented economic system. That comes at a big cost, but it does mean as globalization breaks down that the French don't have that far to fall, because if the EU were to dissolve tomorrow and freedom of the seas would cease to exist next week, the French economic system is largely in-house. They're a massive producer and exporter of agricultural products. They've got energy nearby in both the North Sea and in Northwest Africa. Uh, they're several countries removed from the Ukraine war and what's going on with the Russians. And their primary economic competitor is also their primary political partner in the current environment, and that is Germany. And unlike the French, the Germans have gone whole hog on globalization to the point that we're already seeing massive problems there when it comes to exposure to the Chinese systems or the Russian systems or whatever. The French have none of that. Okay, I think that's pretty good Peter Zion analysis. It's true. The French did not go in the globalist direction that Germany did. As a result, France may well be better positioned to survive than, than Germany. Germany you know, sold out to Russian energy. They got away with it this past winter because it's about the mildest winter on record. But Germany and its economy seem to be in a lot more trouble than France. And then finally, the French demographic is strong because there's a neonatal sort of policy set that encourages people to have kids in large numbers, giving France the healthiest demographic structure in the world outside of New Zealand. And um, the United States happens to be third in that regard uh, among the advanced countries. So all of these things add up to a strong prognosis for the French over the medium to long term. But the racial issue is absolutely France's Achilles heel. And we're seeing no, the, the racial issue is, is everyone's Achilles heel that has the same proportion of races, all right? It's not, not something that's uh, unique to France or something particularly French. All right, might be wondering what went on at the 2023 Melbourne International Comedy Festival. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, my name is He, it's spelled as H-E, and uh, that's it. <laughs> uh, it is my first name, it is not my pronoun. Um, but I know my name is only two letters in English, but in Chinese it's actually spelled as... <laughs> Just one second. <laughs> oh, thank you. Everybody understood. Great. <laughs> Yeah, I, I do grow up in China. Uh, I'm from a small town in China. My hometown is pretty small. We only have half a billion people. <laughs> yeah, they're all Chinese. Um, you probably can tell I am pretty single. I'm in my 30s and uh, very horny. <laughs> For love and uh, visa sponsorship. <laughs> Pretty desperate. <laughs> uh, it's so funny, like, I'm being single, have driven my mom insanely progressive now. Like, in my early 20s, she said to me, she was like, that's my name. <laughs> you can only date Chinese guy from mainland China. I was like, okay. In my late 20s, she was like, hmm. Obama, kind of black, is fine. I said, okay. Now I'm in my 30s, she's like, oh, fuck anyone. 
don't get me wrong, I'm trying. I'm trying to date. I'm trying to stay in shape. Uh, recently, I've been fasting. If you don't know what is fasting, it's basically the modern ways to starve yourself to death. <laughs> You'll be amazed. There are so many ways. Um, I'm fasting this week, and uh, it gave me nightmares. Like, for example, last night, I was dreaming about dry humping. <laughs> rice. Like, why rice? <laughs> one by one. I was like, yes, Jasmine. <laughs> Let's get wet. <laughs> oh, try really hard. I'm trying to date, and like, at English is my second language. I feel like dating in English can be a challenging for me. For example, I found dirty talking. In English, it's really confusing. I have to Google it all the time. <laughs> For example, why it is okay to say, oh, give it to me, daddy? <laughs> but not okay to say, oh, give it to me, uncle. <laughs> like, come on, guys. <laughs> They're the same generation. <laughs> And um, my uncle is hotter than my dad. Okay, the uh, Melbourne Comedy Festival. All right, I just uh, finished a book. And it's on the Tudors, right? It's by, by this uh, bloke, Peter Ackroyd. He's got this multi-part series on history of England. So this is a book on Henry VIII and Elizabeth I. So this is the very conclusion of the book. So talking about the reformation of the English church. So I was raised a Protestant. So I was raised at the most important centuries in Christianity were the, about the fourth century when Christianity became the empire, the, you know, the, the Roman empire, took over the Roman empire and the 16th century when we had the reformation and maybe the, the 20th century. So, but the reformation of the English church, I learned as a child, you know, through much much of a religious lens, but uh, from this book says that reforming the English church was a political matter, right? It had no roots in popular protest, all right? It wasn't the people were crying out for relief from the oppressive burden that's, you know, imposed by the Roman Catholic uh, church. It wasn't driven by principles of, you know, humanist reform, you know, no John Calvin or Martin Luther would have been permitted to flourish in England, but Henry VIII and Elizabeth I were highly discouraging of any forms of religious enthusiasm, and the English have remained over the past well, 500 years uh, quite averse to religious enthusiasm. So the reforming the English church was entirely conducted under the direction of the king and the queen. So in continental Europe, those countries that espouse Protestantism, they did away with rituals and customs of Catholicism. There'd be no mass, no Virgin Mary, no court of the saints. Yet King Henry VIII, right, he was basically an Orthodox Catholic, except when it came to papal sovereignty. So he destroyed some monasteries, he replaced the Pope, but the mass survived. And those who supported the king's reforming of the church were of a practical persuasion. So just like the people who supported Hitler and the people who supported Stalin, they did it for practical reasons. So the supporters of King Henry VIII, they wanted the lands and the revenues of the Catholic Church for themselves. They were lawyers and courtiers. They were members of parliament, and they voted in accordance with the king's will. So for only a very few was the theology of the Reformation important. So what you got in England was kind of a mishmash of contradictory elements that developed the name of Anglicanism. All right? Anglicanism is as alien to the pure spirit of Protestantism as it was to the doctrines of Rome. It was just kind of a mix and match of old religion and new religion. So England became Protestant by degrees, by accommodation, by subtle adjustment, and the people went along. So time, forgetfulness, apathy, indifference, right? That weakened the old religion beyond repair. England became a Protestant nation and what that really meant is that England was no longer Catholic. So the, Protestant, the passage of time accomplished what the will of man could not work. And you see the enduring effects of the Reformation 
in the emphasis on the individual in England rather than on the community. Private prayer takes the place of public ritual. Manuals address the personal devotional life, your personal work, walk with Jesus, right? They abound. Justification by faith alone becomes one of the cardinal tenets of the new religion. This is wholly private in character, right? The struggles